Welcome to Soaring the Sky Glider Pilots Podcast. Hello, my name is Chuck. I will be your host, coming to you from the Mid-Atlantic region here in the United States and flying with the Cumberland Soaring Group. This is episode 38. This episode is brought to you by Arizona Soaring Incorporated, the nation's largest provider of professional glider training. Since 1969, they provided training from initial private through CFI Glider and entry level through advanced aerobatics, open year-round, seven days a week. More information is available at azsoaring.com. On this episode of the podcast, we head to Stanton, Minnesota, to the Minnesota Soaring Club, as we join Stefan Nesser. Stefan shares with us his adventures while soaring, including landing out in some very soggy conditions, and then trying to explain that he didn't crash his aircraft. Stefan Nesser began flying gliders in 1986 and earned his CFIG in 1990, He has over 600 hours and over 1,500 glider flights. He's the chief flight instructor for the Minnesota Soaring Club. As a retired psychotherapist, he's been increasingly aware of the value of humility to safe flight. Humility gives a pilot the ability to accurately appraise one's own abilities and limitations. Stefan is also an artist with watercolor paintings of gliders exhibited in museums around the world, including the Smithsonian's Air and Space Museum. Join us now for another exciting adventure and guest right here on Soaring the Sky. Stefan Nesser, welcome to Soaring the Sky podcast. Glad to have you today. I'm glad to be here. You are flying out to Minnesota, Minnesota Soaring, correct? That's correct. Down in Stanton, Minnesota. Uh, A little closer to my heart this episode because I grew up in Minnesota for part of my childhood, so I'm very happy to talk to you. Well, it's really, really a pleasure to be here, and uh, you should come back and vi- to visit us in the, down in uh, the Minnesota Soaring Club. We'd be glad to take you up for a flight sometime. I would love to do that. When I, I get up and visit the family up there, I'll make a stop and do some flying with you all. That would be that would be a lot of fun. I look so, forward to it. So when did your soaring adventure get started? Well, I would really trace it back to when I was a child. I was always trying to go airborne. I would literally climb up onto the... Uh, roof of our garage with all sorts of contraptions and I would jump off hoping to fly but never succeeded. And then I remember when, when I was about nine years old I was watching the wonderful wonder world of Disney on a Sunday night and they had the boy who flew with condors and I said to myself I remember just being awestruck and said someday I'm going to fly. After I finished college I was uh, moved to Minnesota and one day I was lost and traveling down Highway 19 towards Northfield, and I passed a hangar with a glider hanging from the, the rafters. And I hit the brakes, pulled in, got the information, and called the president of the Minnesota Soaring Club and signed up for uh, instruction. And the Minnesota Soaring Club is really great because once you become a member, they give free instruction, only charging for the cost of the flight. And I had a group of just superb men uh, who taught me how to to fly and soloed me and in time I would turn around and uh, give back to the Minnesota Soaring Club by being a flight instructor and I just finished my 29th year of flight instructing for the Minnesota Soaring Club. Very cool congratulations. Thanks. And thank you for putting all those years into instruction so important in the soaring world for sure. Well you know it's really it's both a pleasure and um, not quite a duty but, it, but it's something that's, I think, important for everybody who flies and gets a lot out of the sport to give back because we're, we're a volunteer operation. And the sport will only grow and, and, and mature when we're all in this together. So I'm just I'm re- I'm thrilled to be uh, instructing with a group of uh, highly talented for, for fellow flight instructors. And we really make a point of making sure that we make sure every student a competent, safe pilot was able to to, uh, go on learning after they solo and uh, become a master of the sky. Very cool. Yeah, super important for sure. What are you flying in when you're training the students? What what aircraft are you you all using? We use uh, our primary training craft is an ASK-21, Schleicher ASK-21. It's our workhorse, and it's just a great ship uh, because it's it's forgiving, uh, and it's a ship that we prefer to solo our students in, again, because it's forgiving. 
We also have a, uh, an owl, um, which we use for all of our advanced training and all of our spin training. And it is arguably, if, um, if you read Derek Pickett's little comments about it, it's probably the most challenging of the two place tra- trainers to fly in because it, when it stalls and spins, it has the most precipitous nose down uh, configuration of any glider. Thus, it picks up an airspeed as you recover quickly and it takes more altitude to recover. So we have, we, have, we start the K21 and we move to the owl and then we'll, we, when they've, they've soloed and they've gotten really good at the owl, we then move them over to our single place glider, which is a junior. And uh, we send them out um, on cross country flights in the junior. I'm not real familiar with the owl. I am a little familiar with the 21. I've flown in that a couple of times, but you tell me a little bit more about the owl and its limitations. Well, actually, it's it's very similar to the K21 in terms of performance. It's got a about a 34 to 1, 33 to 1 glide ratio. The control surfaces, especially the horizontal stabilizer, is much bigger. I would argue it's two to three times bigger than the same number of square inches on the K21. So it's a snappy ship. It's fully aerobatic. Uh, it wants to spin like the bejeebies uh, and really does a very nice spin. It will spin with little or no warning because it has no washout in the wings. So you don't get nearly as much as pre-stall buffet as you would in the K21. Um, so it teaches you to be respectful of, especially in the pattern of maintaining your your, air, your airspeed and flying with the, um, the offspring straight back. Keeping that energy up. Yes, indeed. So when you're not training, what are you flying in personally? What do you like to fly? I fly, I fly two ships. Uh, uh, Marilyn Molina, a member of the club, has lent me her L33 over the last few years. And it is a lovely ship to fly cross country. And then sometimes I fly the club's junior cross country. So those are my two cross country ships when, I, when I'm uh, heading on goals. And in the last uh, about, I've been working well. For the last 33 years, I've been working on getting uh, all of my diamonds uh, in, in these ships. I originally, originally was doing it in the K-8, uh, the Schlecker K-8, but we, the club sold the K-8, so I was able to upgrade. And I have flown the 300K Triangle twice in the last couple of years, once in the Junior and once in the L-33. And I flew the... 500k. Well, the first time I attempted my 500k straight out, I was flying the, the club's junior, and we we're flying from the Stanton, Minnesota. And I was heading to the Chicago Glider Club. It was good, a very good day in terms of the, the clouds, but I got a, about 100% cloud development. It just it became nothing, and it cut off all of the energy, the sun's energy, to the ground, and I started going down and down and down. And I found myself working to, to keep up in the air and allow the this day to redevelop, I was actually working five, 50 foot a minute down uh, lift. I mean, if, if my bariometer said 50 foot a minute down, I was thermally in, in that and uh, was able to buy enough time because I was very high to get back up. And then I ran into a storm. And unfortunately, the ground was soaked. I mean, there were large standing puddles in the farm fields and I was getting lower and lower and lower. And I was looking at my 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 uh, flight computer and I was so close and I was getting lower and lower and eventually I had to land and um, looked at my flight computer and I had done 497 kilometers of the 500 I needed. Now, oh, wow. Now, after I landed, uh, I got out and it was a windy day. So I just kind of um, uh, was hanging out by the glider because I wanted to keep the glider safe. And I look up and um, there was a, a series of vehicles with um, the, the flashers, three police cars, an ambulance, a fire truck. And they were walking out to me. And they asked me for interesting. They asked me for my driver's license, the police officers. And they asked me what happened. And I tried to explain to them that I hadn't crashed, that it was a landing and the gliders are built for this. But they weren't having any of it. And they sent out the, the, the medics and the medics kept looking at me. And I kept telling them, I'm fine. I'm not hurt. And they kept arguing with me that I clearly had suffered a brain injury during the landing. And that's why I th- thought that was thinking nothing was wrong. And we went back and forth on that for a while. And eventually they, uh, they said, we need to throw you in the ambulance. We need to get you to the hospital. And I refused. 
And so they um, made me sign a release that said I am not going to sue them if I, I if I don't go to the hospital. Glad to sign that. And the police officers were grumpy, and everybody was grumpy. And then I turned to them. They were asking me about my my home address, and I was a probation officer at the time. And as a probation officer, I'm allowed to use my work address rather than my home address as my on my driver's license. It protects us from angry uh, folks uh, that, that might try to track us down. And when they found that out, they changed. And they turned to me and they said, is, is there uh, anything the Sugar Grove Police Department can do to help you? And I said, well, you can help me get this collider out of the middle of this field, this muddy field. <laughs> and they three big, muscular police officers helped me haul it out. And meanwhile, my sister, I called my sister who lives in Chicago and she'd come to visit me, but they didn't let me come out because they didn't want to see the, the gore of, of, of the, her brother who had been uh, mauled in, in a, this, this accident. My sister came out, we hauled, they hauled the glider. The police officers were wonderful. They helped me disassemble the glider. We threw it into the trailer and off we went. They were just absolutely wonderful. So I, you know, it kind of gave me some some pause when I landed out to to realize that somebody had called in and said there's a plane in the field and therefore it has to be an accident and maybe I want to call 911, the local 911, and give them a heads up. But I didn't follow that advice. I was flying in the Region Seven soaring contest in the L33 two years ago. I had run. There was a cold front that was moving through a storm front end, and as it turned out, it was right on the path of where I needed to go. And I flew about 60 miles in an L33, which is, has a 33 to one glide ratio. It's not a huge performing glider. I flew with it the entire 60 miles and I circled one turn once. And I was higher when I arrived at, at, at the turn point than when I did. So I immediately turned back and did the whole way back without turning once, without circling once. I was beating all of the, the, the super high performing gliders. It was amazing. And I turned left and, and I was going to head straight to the to, to the, the field and I hit powerful, powerful sink. But I said, I can I can make it. I'm about 9,000 feet of AGL. I can get there. And then I looked at the, the, the runway and it was literally covered in rain. The, the visibility wouldn't have been 15 feet. And I had to turn back. And I kept getting blown further, further and further and further and further and further and further away from the run, runway. And when the pushed by, by, by the storm front that what was the front, and when I got down to Mason City, which is, I don't know, about 70, 80 miles away from the airport, three and a half hours later, I was able to then to go back, but there was no lift because all the rain had cut off all the heat from the ground. So I was just getting slowly lower and lower and lower and lower and lower, and, lower and I couldn't make it. So I landed out, landed to the farmer's field, and I was walking to the farmer's field. And I was going to walk up to this house and say, hey, I landed in your field. Well, how do you want me to get my glider my glider out of your field? And a sheriff's deputy pull, pulls off, lights flashing. And he pulls me into the car and tells me to get into his vehicle. And I explained what happened. And he kept saying, you crashed. And I kept explaining. I said, no, this is this is a glider. It, 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 I landed there's no harm to me, no harm to the glider. He kept saying, you're cr crashed. I said, no, 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 no. He didn't. He said, well, the fire department and the ambulances are on their way. And I said, well, tell them that, that they don't need to come. They're, this is a glider. There's no fuel on board. There's nothing that can catch on fire. And he said, they have to come. So two fire trucks showed up. Lights flashing. The ambulance showed up. Another deputy sheriff, sheriff showed up. And we all marched out to the glider and I explained how it, you know, it wasn't going to catch fire. And at the time I was fine. And again, they thought I was brain injured because clearly I had crashed in this farmer's field. And therefore, I, I wasn't lucid anymore. And I again signed another form explaining what I wasn't. I said, great. I said, can you guys help me get this out of this field? To which the state highway, the Iowa State Highway Patrolman who had showed up said, you can't move it. I'm I am. I don't know what, what the word he uses, but he's basically saying I'm putting it on hold so you uh, until an, an accident investigation occurs. And I said, but there hasn't been an accident. He said, we're calling the FAA now. Now, it was 6 o'clock p.m. on the Friday before Memorial Day, and they were trying to get a hold of people in Washington, D.C. at 7 p.m. in the FAA, and they weren't having any luck. Meanwhile, another storm front was moving 
through. And I tried to, to explain to them, look, it's not an accident. The, the FAA, this is going to be okay with the FAA. We do this all the time. They would have nothing of it. Eventually, they re relented. And uh, the fire department had some of this all-terrain vehicle. They started hauling me across the field. And then the sheriff shows up. And he was unhappy with me landing in this farmer's field because he thought I might have damaged the farmer's corpse. I hadn't, but he was worried about it. And so he made a stop and they made the fire truck get out. And then the rain came and turned the field into a muddy mess. Eventually, the, uh, they reached the FAA. I don't know how they do it. They released the glider to me. We took it apart, carried it out of the field. And interestingly, the farmer was just fabulous. He, he said he was really sorry about us not getting it out before the rain. They couldn't get the truck back in during the rain. So he said, I just cut that barbed wire fence. We don't need it anyway. So we took the barbed wire fence down and carried the glider out and put it in mine on. Meanwhile, the uh, local news media shows up. The, the local television shows up and they're filming all of this. So we've got two deputy sheriffs. We've got the sheriff. We've got two fire trucks. We've got an ambulance, all with the lights. And we've got the news media. And now the deputy sheriff picking up on the sheriff's angry, put me back in his in his truck to ask me some more questions. And when I went to get out to help the crew put the take the glider apart, I found that I was locked in, so I couldn't get out uh, of the vehicle. So I was kind of locked in there for a little while, watching my crew take apart the glider. But eventually everything was good. The farmer said, "Don't worry about it." There was no farm to the to the crops, and everybody. Went home, but next time for sure, I think I'm going to give going to give the uh, local 911 a call and say, just let you know, I, I landed. There's no problem. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you had to go through it twice. <laughs> yeah, well, I, and I'm guessing I'm not the only person who's had that experience. Yeah, I have talked to a few people that have landed out, and sure enough, you know, here comes the EMS, but which, you know, is good, but it, they don't understand the whole glider thing most of the time. And yeah, it's, it's tough. <laughs> and you're yeah, trying yeah, to talk, yeah. talk yourself out of it and a brain injury. Wow. You know, <laughs> so they're not listening to anything you have to say because they feel you got injured and don't know what you're saying. Indeed. You're right. Indeed. You're right. They, uh, and, and they're erring on the side of caution. And yes, it's like what you said is exactly right. I can't tell you how grateful I am to those guys. You know, they responded quickly. If I would have been injured, they would have been there and they could have easily saved my life. So, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So for people that don't know the terrain in Minnesota, being that I lived there for a while, I do. But what is it like around Minnesota soaring? Um, I'm pretty sure you just have thermal soaring, correct? Well, all right. In the southern Minnesota, that's absolutely true. However, there was briefly a soaring club that was established with a Schleicher ASK-21 in the Duluth area. And uh, if you got, you could have could have done some ridge soaring against the north shore, uh, shore. So that was a possibility too. But yeah, it's it's thermal to thermal entirely. There's there's nothing that was going to give us any uh, ridge lift or uh, certainly no mountain wave. It's pretty dang flat. Yeah, up here when we're flying down the ridges, you know, they will use the thermals to soar. But especially if they're doing a cross country, they'll also get into wave to help them get further and then back and forth and so on. But I personally haven't done any any wave soaring. But yeah, so that makes it a little tougher, right? When you're just depending on the thermals to do some of these cross country flights. Well, it's a matter of uh, watching the weather. We we will uh, watching the weather usually a week out. And we've got a group of the, the diehard uh, cross-country pilots who we uh, do a three-day three, three day warning. We say, we say, we think Monday is going to be a good day. We'll look at it. We'll plan on it. And we'll start seeing who's interested. We'll arrange for a tow pilot. And as we get closer, if the day's good, we'll all meet down at the airport and, and get ready to go cross-country. And then we help crew for each other if should some of us not get back to the airport. What are some of your goals for the future as far as your, I mean, obviously you're an instructor, so I would imagine you're going to continue to do that. But are are you doing anything else with more cross country contests? What are your plans? Well, I've, I've been fly I've flown the uh, Region Seven contest the last two years, and each year I've gotten better. I'm not a particularly good competition pilot. It's a very different skill set. I have gotten two legs of my diamond, and like you, I would like to get my um, uh, flying some wave, and I'd like to get my uh, diamond leg of my uh, diamond badge and then apply for my full diamond. I think that would be just uh, a fun, fun thing to do. 
Um, I really enjoy flight instructing. We at the Minnesota Soaring Club have, in the years past, been inviting a lot of very young folks, and I was training a 13-year-old uh, this year as well as a 14 and a 15 to 16. We've got a whole uh, group of uh, young people that we're really welcoming into the sport. Um, and we provide the Minnesota Soaring Club due to the, the efforts of many of our members of uh, able to provide this at a very low cost to the students. I would like to expand that program. I'm hoping that we're going to be able to do that in, in the future with uh, some support from uh, some airlines or something. We'll provide the free flight instruction if the airlines can provide us some money to pay for the students' flights. And uh, we'll uh, hopefully give a whole new generation of pilots uh, really committed to soaring and also developing the skills that make for good fighter pilots, good airline pilots, the 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 sight, the uh, sight line, the flying by attitude, all the things that can really make a difference in a life and death situation and when you're flying a, a big plane, an A320 or, or whatever. So that's really the, the big goals for us. I mean, I'm, well, we're ex exceptionally lucky, as I mentioned before, because We've got we've got flight instructors like like Bob Wander, arguably the the greatest flight living great the greatest living flight instructor in the world, uh, flies for the Minnesota Soaring Club uh, with us, and you know we just are able to harness that knowledge. I did my flight review with him a couple of years ago, and he introduced me to some maneuvers that I had never learned before. We were uh, uh, a flight in which we were losing a thousand foot per minute by flying in a precipitous slip or significant S to turns to lose. We entered uh, on a short final at a thousand feet above the ground. And uh, by the time we got near the ed edge of the runway, I was down to about 150 feet off the deck and able to just pull the air brakes and, and do a, a normal landing. Important skills to have, always learning, always developing new knowledge, always reading, so that I'm a better flight instructor and the next generation of flight students or flight instructors will be much better flight instructors themselves. Wow. Can you back up a little bit and tell me about that landing? You're a thousand feet above the runway, final. How do you yeah, do that? Short final. We're only maybe a quarter of a mile from the end of the runway, a thousand feet AGO. There's, so there's two ways you, Bob showed me how, how to lose one. One is the S turn. So imagine you do a 60 degree angle of bank, full air brakes, turn left, right, left, right. Never just constantly asking left, left, right, left, right. Always keeping the airport in sight. Because of that precipitous angle of bank, because of the air brakes are fully out, we're coming down at about 500, 600 foot a minute. And, and all I need to do is just fly for, for a minute and a half and I'm, I'm ready to level off and, and, and finish the landing just in a, in a normal attitude with a half air breaks out. It's Very a cool. marvelous way to lose it. The other way is just a powerful uh, slip. Uh, it almost feels like the, it isn't, but all, probably I'm in a 60 to 70 degree uh, wings down situation in, in order to maximize the thing. My caution to uh, your listeners, do not do this without an experienced flight instructor in the, in the ship the first time you're doing either one of these maneuvers. These are maneuvers that require training, especially when you're that low to, to the earth. Absolutely. I was just gonna, going to say that. Yeah, make sure you definitely have instruction before you attempt anything like that, yeah. especially, especially in that situation when you're on final. It's very dangerous yes. if you don't know what you're doing. And so, yeah, I mean, the big, the big thing is we build we build knowledge off of all all the various flight instructors are constantly building knowledge. We're always pushing each other to learn more and sharing what we've learned. So I'm really looking forward to, to it. And we're training them. We've got a new group of uh, flight instructor candidates that uh, I uh, uh, start what well, we start training in the in the near ahead. I'm the chief flight instructor for the Minnesota Science Club, so I'll be uh, organizing their training in, in the uh, next season. And I hope to have them all. Uh, uh, get their flight instructor certificate and uh, start flight instructing in the Minnesota Soaring Club. And we'll start a mentorship program where we'll let the senior uh, flight instructors uh, uh, work with them and uh, gain from the knowledge and experience of, of all the years of flight instructing that the senior members have done. We're getting older, older as flight instructors, and it's time to uh, be thinking about the next generation so that this sport remains viable long after I'm dead. 
Well, you have some great advice for clubs. It sounds like you guys are really active. I'm excited about what you're doing for the young people. We have spoke earlier on previous episodes of the podcast. So important to get young people involved. And there is so many distractions now that it's great if you can get them involved. Can You can get them to the glider port because what I've seen once they are at the glider port, they do get very excited about aviation. Yes, they do. I mean, it's really, uh, you know, and especially the kids. They, they, they walk to the airport not thinking that they could possibly do this. And then they're 14 or 15 and they're flying this magnificent 50-foot uh, wing glider uh, all by themselves. And it's just a moment of like, wow, I've done the impossible. It opens doors. It opens the imagination. Oh, absolutely. So being an instructor, if you had some advice that you could give our listeners, what do you feel would be some great advice to help them be a better pilot, but also a safer pilot? To be a better pilot, it's really important to spend some time at home reading the recommended text, whatever your flight instructor recommends as a text. I cannot tell you how many students I've had who have not done any homework at home, and they have to take 50% more flights than somebody who's doing the study at home. It's a, it's a money saver, and it's a, it's a time shortener because they understand what's happening, and their learning is enriched and deepened, and then the memory is, is, is strengthened because they're, they're reading about it at home. So in terms of, the, uh, of becoming a better student, I would recommend that. The single most important attribute to safety, I, I would argue that the FAA got it exactly right when they were thinking about the hazardous attitudes, is to, to be thinking about the attitudes you carry into the cockpit that make you less than a safe pilot. And I would argue that the single most important attribute is one what I would just call humility, recognizing that you don't know everything Things will happen to you you don't have knowledge for. And to stay, to to keep an envelope uh, around you, these are the things that will cause me to end this flight, going for a landing, whatever, not get too far from the airport on this windy day, not get blown down when, because you you can say, I'm not, I know that bad things can happen to me, and they will happen to anybody who flies enough, regardless of, Uh, how careful they are, but be humble about it rather than saying, let me see how far I can push it, how far away I can get, because those are the situations that get you in trouble. One of the the, the things that I've learned in the last couple of days, I was flying uh, with my friend Marilyn Moline in the K-21, and I was at uh, 6,000 feet uh, MSL uh, above one of our local towns, a town called Northfield, which is six, seven miles from the runway. Easy, easy to get back to, to the airport from, from 6,000 feet to the Stanton uh, with a 34 to 1 glide ratio. And so I topped out, couldn't get any higher because of the class Bravo airspace above me. So I started heading back to the, uh, uh, to the airport and I hit such powerful sink that uh, two miles later, and I was veering to, to avoid it, I was 1,000 feet above the ground level. I had, I had flown for about two minutes and I had something like a three to one glide ratio because of the powerful sink and nothing I could do to get out of it. And I've come to realize that these types of events are happening more and more. And I suspect it has to do with the global warming, that it it makes the the extremes of weather, both good and bad for glider pilots, uh, more frequent and more extreme. And so, one of the things I would caution students about is to assume that it's because it has never happened to anybody before, it's never happened to the old timers, the weather itself is changing. And because we all fly in the weather, be aware that, that things that heretofore un, unheard of could happen to, to any pilot in the air in the years ahead. Absolutely. And the weather is changing fast. It's very important to keep a very close eye on it. Yes. One of the other questions I ask is, what is one of your most memorable flights? I know you just gave me a couple um, examples, some really cool flights. But if you would have another flight that really stuck out in your mind, what would that be? So I was second time I was going for my 500K uh, diamond leg. I um, took off, uh, was heading, uh, and uh, I was during our our annual soaring camp. And uh, the... uh, 
Leon Zug, one of our flight instructors who was doing the weather for forecast for the camp said, Stefan, this is the day. Look at this weather chart. You could go all the way to the Gulf of Mexico on these winds. It'll be smooth sailing all the way. Go for your 500K. But unfortunately, because I've been teaching, teaching some silence, I got a real late start. I mean, like two hours late start. But I got into my plane and I said, I'm going for it. I'm going in the L33. And I had a, my, my crew was going to chase me and off, off I went. And oh man, the, the day was fabulous. And at one point I looked over and there was a bald eagle and he was soaring faster, climbing faster than me. I went and joined him and he left the, the thermal and I was shooting up and then the bald eagle came back and we were literally wingtip to wingtip thermaline in the same thermal. It was beautiful and spectacular. And I flew into Iowa and I was still going great bejeebies. And it was, at one point, uh, uh, one of our club members analyzed my flight. He said I was going over a averaging over a hundred miles an hour. The winds were just incredibly strong at altitude, and I was about eight, nine thousand feet above ground level. All the way through Iowa, as I was about oh I don't know about 20, 30 miles uh, to the east of uh, Des Moines, I looked down. There was an itty bitty Learjet flying beneath me, and I thought this is just great. And then, unbeknownst to me, back in, in Stanton, Leon turns to somebody else and said, I guess I should have told Stefan that this. And he pulled up a little map that showed the recent rainfall in Missouri. And they had different colors for, for, for the, the rainfalls. And Missouri's colors were, were navy blue as if it was like biblical floods, NOAA-level floods. And so I crossed into uh, oh, the Iowa border into Missouri, and I'm watching my, 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 my little tick off on my, my flight uh, instrument. And it's, you know, and I was getting 470 Ks. I just 30 more. I can do this. But I wasn't running into any more lift. And I mean, it, I would occasionally go down less, but I, I wasn't, wasn't any lift. But I found something. I pulled it right back to, to, to the perfect L over D speed. And just to, flew flew along that, and I found that I could listen to the sound uh, of the wind on the wings, and I could use that as a much more accurate variometer than my, my, my audio variometer in the plane. And so I flew entirely by sound um, in terms of, of when to slow down, when to speed up, and it was incredibly accurate. It was a kind of a, a magic moment to use just pure sound to fly. And I was getting closer and closer, you know, 490K. And then I'm looking down and thinking, dang, Missouri's got an awful lot of sheep farms and an awful lot of forests, northern Missouri. Where am I going to land? And I was looking for an airport and looked for it. And finally, 500K passes on my, my, my instrument saying, I've done it. I've finally got my, after 30 years of trying, I've finally gotten my, my 500k and i flew another i'm going to make it put by a little bit margin of safety one flew and i was heading in for a landing and i realized it wasn't a safe field but i had broken off at about 1500 jgl so i just flew over to another field and i landed in the field and i didn't know about the flooding and when i touched down the field was so muddy that it's almost instantaneously stopped me it just the mud the plane just sunk into the mud um <laughs> but the farmer came out with his all-terrain vehicle he helped me haul the plate out he was just great it took hours for my crew to catch up with me as you can imagine if i was flying at 100 miles an hour and uh, my crew was many hours behind and we packed up the plane in the dark with the farmer's help and headed back it was a it was a, just a magical flight flying with eagles, flying above Learjets, flying in this beautiful sky with all these incredible clouds. And I, all, I, all I'd wished is that if, if the ground had been a little bit drier, I probably could have got, gone hundreds of miles further. But you take what you can get. Well, congratulations. Thanks. And, and no EMS. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 well said. Well said. Yeah, yeah, yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, well, Stefan, thank you for joining me on the podcast today. So great to have you and so nice to talk to someone from my uh, home state of Minnesota. So thank you. 
Well, we'll look forward to seeing you down in Stanton someday soon. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. I usually get up to Minnesota in the summertime, not every summer, but try to get up there as much as I can. Of course, you know, Oshkosh is always a good excuse to go around that time of year, too, right on the way. Indeed. Well, thanks, Chuck. Hey, Chuck, thanks for doing this for the sport of story. This is exactly what we need. We need to get the story, stories out so that people realize what a joy it is to fly gliders and come and join us in the air. Absolutely. You're welcome. And it is a great sport and it is exciting and more people need to know about it. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to the podcast. If this is your first time listening, thank you and welcome to the podcast family. If you're a loyal listener, I greatly appreciate your continued support and all your positive feedback you've been sending. Thank you for that. To check out some pictures of our current guest and previous guest, of course, you can go to SoaringTheSky.com. While you're online, you can join our Facebook group, That's Soaring the Sky Podcast on Facebook. On Instagram, it is the same, Soaring the Sky Podcast. You will hear about some upcoming guests and posts from our pilots soaring in the community on Facebook as well as Instagram. If you want to show off your support for the podcast, you can go to redbubble.com, search Soaring the Sky, pick up a coffee mug, a t-shirt, sticker, just search Soaring the Sky on Redbubble. If you are a pilot and you want to share your adventure, of course, I would love to hear from you. Email me, chuck at soaringthesky.com. If you just want to say hi, of course, I'd love to hear from you also. And, of course, always a great place to check out, ssa.org, for all your soaring information as well as finding maybe your first glider ride, ssa.org. They also have some great webinars on there to check out. So ssa.org. We hope you join us next week for another great guest right here on Soaring the Skies.